Uh, notices for this the fourth Sunday after Pentecost. Uh, we thank you for all those YouTube subscribers. We're gradually getting towards that uh, thousand figure so we can live stream on YouTube, which is what we're uh, hoping to do in the future. So thank you for subscribing. Uh, and uh, if you can get others to subscribe, that would be great too. Uh, remember to take a copy of the notices and uh, St. Rita's Book Barrel is on Sunday and St. Anaeus Catholic Youth Ap Apologetics Club is on next Saturday, the 4th of July. And also on the 10th of July is the rosary, the pro-life rosary after the 5.30pm mass and approximately 6.15 praying all 15 decades uh, for life causes. Uh, just a note with regards to Sunday Masses, we are still having uh, seven Sunday Masses, even though rules were changed yesterday on Saturday, the 27th of June. Uh, due to government regulations on spacing, we are still limited here at St Anne's with respect to the rules. Uh, for this reason, that there are still seven Masses and uh, you need to still book in for the time being. Uh, so we can space the people out throughout the day. So those seven masses on. So please make sure you're also on the email list uh, to get the um, information on the bulletin and the additional sermon, which is emailed out each week, which is, of course, different to the emails uh, to the YouTube sermon, which I will give today. And now I read the Epistle and Gospel from this, the fourth Sunday after Pentecost. From the Epistle of the Romans. Brethren, I reckon that the sufferings of this time are not worthy to be compared with the glory to come that shall be revealed in us. For the expectation of the creature waiteth for the revelation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him that made it subject in hope. Because the creature also itself shall be delivered from the servitude of corruption into the liberty of the glory of the children of God. For we know that every creature groaneth and travaileth in pain, even till now. And not only it, but ourselves also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even as we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption of the sons of God, the redemption of our body in Christ Jesus our Lord. And the Gospel today is from the Gospel of St Luke, chapter 5. At that time, when the multitude pressed upon Jesus to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesareth, and he saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were waiting, washing their nets. And going up into one of the ships that was Simon's, he desired him to draw back a little from the land. And sitting, he taught the multitude out of the ship. Now when he had ceased to speak, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let your nets down for a draught. And Simon answering said to him, Master, we have laboured all the night, and have taken nothing, but at thy word I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they enclosed a very great multitude of fishes, and their net broke. And they beckoned to their partners that were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships, so that they were almost sinking. Which, when Simon Peter saw, he said, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was wholly astonished, and all that were with him, at the draught of fishes that they had taken. And so also were James and John, the partners of Zebedee, who were Simon's partners. And Jesus said to Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. And having brought their ships to land, Leaving all things, they followed him. Saint Ambrose, the fourth century Archbishop of Milan, who baptised Saint Augustine, 
draws our attention to the fact that the boat in today's gospel, Peter's boat, is the same boat that the apostles found themselves in during a storm while our Lord was asleep. This is from the lesson of Matin's fourth Sunday after Pentecost. Now this storm on the Sea of Galilee took place after our Lord had healed a large number of people and before he had cast out a number of devils on the other side of the lake. The boat and all aboard might have perished had not our Lord calmed the wind and the waves. So we hear in St Matthew's Gospel, chapter 8. And quite likely, the boat is also the boat in which the apostles alone were travelling to the town of Gessenar after the multiplication of the loaves in the desert. You may recall that on that occasion, our Lord came to them walking on the water and he even got St Peter to take a few steps on the water before Peter looked down and had second thoughts about what he was doing and began to sink. St Matthew chapter 14 and St Mark chapter 6. So from these miracles, it's clear that our Lord exercised power over all creatures, animate and inanimate, material and spiritual. Of these three events on St Peter's boat, today's is the only one that is ultimately fruitful in producing the great catch of fish. On the other two occasions, they were able to make their voyage safely, but had nothing in particular to show for it. Now, in today's account, they caught so many fish, of course, that their net was in danger of breaking, and others had to be called in to gather the great bounty of the sea. There is a similar event, of course, as we know after the resurrection, recorded in St John's Gospel, in which Peter and the apostles caught 153 fish uh, and another net-stretching load when directed by our Lord to cast out the nets, St John chapter 21. We might ask then, what is the difference between these two great productive events with their great catches of fish? and the two events that were little more than survival when our Lord calmed the sea and walked on water. Now, the difference in all cases, of course, is faith. Why are ye fearful, a ye of little faith? Our Lord asked of those in the violently bobbing boat in the sea. O thou of little faith, why did thou doubt? He asked the spluttering Peter as he sank into the water as he pulled him into the boat. Now the apostles in the cases where they were afraid of their lives being lost lacked faith in that they should have known that any voyage set out upon by our Lord would be successful. The boat could not be overwhelmed any more than our Lord could perish without his explicit consent. At first, when Peter walks on the water, he had faith. Lord, if that is you, bid me to come to you over the water. And through faith, faith, St Peter knew that he could do anything that Jesus asked him to do. But then he felt the power of the wind and began to think in merely human terms, perhaps it was better to be safe than to wind up at the bottom of the sea. But here in today's Gospel, we find faith in Peter and the Apostles. They have just heard our Lord preach on the boat and they are impressed with his command of the truth, speaking the truth. This is a man who speaks with divine authority, the like of which they have never accounted before in their lives. So if he says, put out your nets into the deep and lower your nets, They know that they would be foolish not to do so. Filled with faith, they they knew that our Lord would not send them on a disappointing or false errand. This is a similar event after the resurrection with the 153 fish, a manifestation of faith. They had already encountered our Lord in this, resurrected by the dead, and by comparison getting a few fish to jump into the net as opposed to rising from the dead, was nothing. 
But in this post-resurrection miracle, it seems that they did not recognise him immediately. But when the miraculous catch of fish occurred of 153, there was no doubt in St Peter's mind by faith when he exclaims, it is the Lord, and jumped out of the boat into the water in his hurry to swim before our Lord who was standing on the shore. Now, St. Paul, of course, puts these events into an interesting perspective. The first few chapters of his epistle to Romans deals with the sin of Adam and Eve and how, through original sin, death entered into the world. But through the death of our Lord on the cross and through our belief in him and our following his way in the world, not the ways of the world, but his way in the world, we may be freed from the consequences of sin and save our mortal soul. But here in the eighth chapter, which we heard a bit in the morning here, he suggests that the effects of original sin were universal, extending even to all of creation. As he says, all creation groans and travails in pain until now. Now, St Paul's words, of course, are a little bit vague. It is not clear whether he is writing about a change in creation which has already taken place by virtue of the sacrifice of the cross or about a change that will take place on Judgment Day with the new heaven and new earth which we read about in the book of Apocalypse, chapter 21 and following. Or perhaps he is writing about the here and the now. Perhaps he is saying that faith in our Lord Jesus Christ and walking in the way of our Lord, imitating his morality and his behaviour, will have a beneficial effect on the natural world around us. In this era where everyone's going on about the coronavirus, it'd be interesting to see what would happen if the world followed the ways of our Lord, rather than just saying the ways of the world, worrying about isolating and staying away from God in his holy church. Perhaps he is saying that if we have faith in our Lord and walk the way of our Lord, imitating his morality and his behaviour, this will have a beneficial effect on the natural world around us. Now, the large catch of fish, of course, was an occasional miracle worked by our Lord for those who believed in him. And we know that these large miracles are relatively rare. Great miracles have to be rare, of course, otherwise the world would be too chaotic for us to live in, with the natural laws of the world continually shifting. But smaller miracles seem to be woven into the fabric of nature. The ability of sunlight and water and minerals to bring forth food the ability of people and plants and animals to turn that food into their living flesh when they eat, the ability of living flesh to reproduce and bring forth its kind. All these things are smaller miracles, but nonetheless essential miracles that go on continuously every day. Now, as we know, God knows all our needs. As he says, he knows the needs of the birds of the air, and the lilies of the field. But it is beneficial, if not absolutely necessary, that we will call upon God and ask for our needs. We have this on the authority of our Lord himself, our Father who art in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. And indeed, we need to pray that prayer today with all the many evils in the world around us. And we also have this on the authority of the Holy Catholic Church, founded by our Lord himself. Apart from the Lord's Prayer, the ordinary prayers of the Mass, those repeated day in and day out, seem to look forward to the Kingdom of Heaven and ask very little for our material well-being. If you look at the prayers of the Mass, most of them are talking about the Kingdom of Heaven, looking forward to that. But of course, the Church recognises our earthly material needs 
and also adds them to her recurring prayer. I would urge you all to take a look through your daily missal. Beyond prayers for the church's needs, there are masses for peace, for relief from pestilence, from the plague. There are masses for pilgrims and travellers, for the sick, for the bride and groom at the start of their married life. And there is a general purpose mass for any necessity, and even one to be said in time of war. You, of course, remember when we had the Regation Day, we said the extra special prayers to avert the plague and uh, ask God's protection from St Anne's here in the time of the plague, when we had those Regation Days just before Ascension Thursday. And as we know, there are prayers that can be added to other masses, for those who govern the country, for a congregation or family, for a community, to avert earthquakes, to avert famine or the plague, hurricanes and drought, and prayers for our friends and for our enemies as well. Prayers for those who are at sea, those who are at jail, and prayers for the living as well as the dead. That is why sometimes during the week, as you know, there is sometimes more than just one colic. There might be three, there might be five, and there could even be seven. And as we know, several times a year, we have the Ember Days and Regation Days as mentioned, to praise God for his seasonal bounty, but also to ask for its increase and for protection against material and misfortune, against material ruin and misfortune. But in all these prayers of the Mass and these extra prayers, such prayers are much more effective if we pray them, of course, with great faith. And while living the moral life of our Lord, walking in his ways. Why do we say that the prayer of the just man averts much? Because as we know, those living in the way of the Lord are closer to God. That's why we ask for the prayers of young children, because please God, they're more closer to God. As our Lord himself said, their angels are close to my Father in heaven, closer than ours. So we ask everyone their prayers, especially the just person. So the prayers are more effective then if we actually pray them, not leaving them unread in the pages of our missal. And they are most effective, of course, if we pray them in person at Holy Mass, at the Holy Sacrifice, not expecting the priest alone to do it all for us, what we are unwilling to do for ourselves, but rather praying those prayers at Holy Mass when we attend and praying those prayers with him. And if we do that, those prayers will be much more efficacious. Of course, we can't get to Mass in some parts of the world. That's why, of course, we've been trying to YouTube a Mass every day and please God a sung Mass. So you can all follow the Mass, you can all pray the Mass and follow it in your Missal or on the link below. So St Paul says, All creation groans and travails in pain until now. Now, of course, we have the redemption of all mankind by our Lord on the cross. Now we have the perfect prayer of the holy sacrifice of the Mass. So it remains for us to have faith and morality and to join the Church in praying for the tranquility of creation and for blessings from heaven. As we say in the Holy Mass, Give us this day our daily bread and deliver us from all evil. In the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen.